On April 8, 1994 Kurt Cobain, the lead singer and guitarist of the American rock band Nirvana, was found dead at his home on Lake Washington Boulevard in Seattle, Washington. Forensics investigators and a coroner later determined that Cobain had died on April 5 three days prior to the discovery of his body. The Seattle Police Department incident report stated that Cobain was found with a shotgun across his body, had suffered a visible gunshot wound to the head, and that a suicide note had been discovered nearby. Seattle Police confirmed Cobain's death as a suicide. Conspiracy theories that Cobain was murdered were spread and reported to the Federal Bureau of Investigation partially due to an Unsolved Mysteries episode dedicated to Cobain's death. On April 1, 1994 Cobain left the rehabilitation center he had checked into two days before, Exodus Recovery Center, by scaling a six-foot wall. On April 2, 1994 Cobain took a taxi to a Seattle gun shop where he purchased and received a receipt for shotgun shells. Cobain told the taxi driver he wanted to buy shells because he had been burglarized. On April 8, 1994 Cobain's body was discovered in the greenhouse above the garage at his Lake Washington Boulevard East house by VEC Electric employee Gary T. Smith who arrived that morning to install security lighting. Smith initially thought Cobain was asleep until he saw blood coming out of Cobain's ear. He also found a suicide note with a pen stuck through it inside a flower pot. A Remington Model 11 20-gauge shotgun purchased for Cobain by his friend musician Dylan Carlson was found on Cobain's chest. It had been legally purchased by Carlson at Stan Baker's gun shop in Seattle. Although conductor David Woodard had built a dream machine for Cobain, rumors that Cobain had been using the device heavily in the days leading up to his suicide were contradicted by later reports. Cobain did not want the gun purchased in his name because he thought the police might seize it for his own protection. The police had taken away his guns twice in the previous 10 months. The King County Medical Examiner noted puncture wounds on the inside of both the right and left elbows. The shotgun was not checked for fingerprints until May 6, 1994. The Seattle Police report states that the shotgun was inverted on Cobain's chest with his left hand wrapped around the barrel. On April 14, 1994 the Seattle Post Intelligencer reported that Cobain was high on heroin when he pulled the trigger. The paper reported that the toxicological test determined that the level of morphine in Cobain's bloodstream was 1.52 mg per liter and that there was evidence of Valium in his blood. The report contained a quote from Randall Basil to the Chemical Toxicological Institute and author of all 12 editions of the Common Forensic Toxicology Textbook Disposition of Toxic Drugs and Chemicals in Man, including its chapter on heroin which stated that Cobain's heroin level was at a high concentration by any account but that the strength of the dose would depend on many factors including how habituated Cobain was to the drug. Cobain did not want the gun purchased in his name because he thought the police might seize it for his own protection. The police had taken away his guns twice in the previous 10 months. The King County Medical Examiner noted puncture wounds on the inside of both the right and left elbows. The shotgun was not checked for fingerprints until May 6, 1994. The Seattle Police Report states that the shotgun was inverted on Cobain's chest with his left hand wrapped around the barrel. On April 14, 1994 the Seattle Post Intelligencer reported that Cobain was high on heroin when he pulled the trigger. The paper reported that the toxicological test determined that the level of morphine in Cobain's bloodstream was 1.52 mg per liter and that there was evidence of Valium in his blood. The report contained a quote from Randall Basil to the Chemical Toxicological Institute and author of Toxic Drugs and Chemicals in Man, including its chapter on heroin which stated that Cobain's heroin level was at a high concentration by any account but that the strength of the dose would depend on many factors including how habituated Cobain was to the drug. In March 2014 the Seattle Police Department developed four rolls of film that had been left in an evidence vault. According to Seattle Police the photographs depict the scene of Cobain's corpse more clearly than previous Polaroid images taken by the police. Detective Mike Kinsky, a cold case investigator, was asked to look at the film because it is 20 years later and it's a high media case. Kinsky stated that the official cause of Cobain's death remained suicide and that the images would not be released to the public. The images were released in 2016. The Seattle Police Department receives at least one request weekly, mostly through Twitter, to reopen the investigation. This resulted in the maintenance of the basic incident report on file. Several of Cobain's friends were surprised by his suicide. Mark Lanigan, a longtime friend of Cobain, 
told Rolling Stone, I never knew Cobain to be suicidal. I just knew he was going through a tough time. In the same article, Carlson stated that he wished Cobain or someone close to him had told him that the Rome incident was a suicide attempt. Danny Goldberg, founder of Gold Mountain Records, refers in his book Dispatches from the Culture Wars, how the left lost teen spirit to the crazy internet rumors that Kurt Cobain had not committed suicide but had been murdered stating that Cobain's suicide haunts him every day. Anthony Kiedis, lead singer of Red Hot Chili Peppers expressed his feelings in his autobiography, Scar Tissue, writing, The news of Cobain's death sucked the air out of the entire house. I didn't feel like I felt when Hillel died. It was more like the world just suffered a great loss. Kurt's death was unexpected. It was an emotional blow and we all felt it. I don't know why everyone on earth felt so close to that guy. He was beloved and endearing and inoffensive in some weird way. For all of his screaming and all of his darkness he was just lovable said Kiedis. The song Tearjerker from the band's One Hot Minute album was written about Cobain. A musical hero of Cobain's, Greg Sage said in an interview I can't really speculate other than what he said to me that he wasn't at all happy about it. Success to him seemed like a brick wall and there was nowhere else to go but down. It was too artificial for him and he wasn't an artificial person at all. Two weeks after he died he was supposed to come here and he wanted to record a bunch of Lead Belly covers. It was kind of in secret. People would definitely not allow him to do that. Cobain was a billion dollar industry at the time. If the industry had any idea at all of him wishing or wanting to get out they couldn't have allowed that. If he was just to get out of the music scene he'd be totally forgotten but if he was to die he'd be immortalized. Some controversy arose after Cobain's death regarding whether his 1.52 mg per liter blood morphine level indicates irrefutable evidence of a fatal overdose. The doubt on this subject has been contributed to by a lack of clarification whether the 1.52 mg per liter figure from Cobain's toxicology report represents a total morphine evaluation or a free morphine evaluation that is a more specialized test. The distinction between a the two counts is important in determining a survivable dose. A 2002 study by Forensic Science International showed that a total morphine count of 1.52 mg per liter can be survivable while a free morphine count above 0.12 mg per liter is fatal. It remains unconfirmed whether Cobain's toxicology figure of 1.52 mg per liter was the result of a free morphine evaluation or total morphine evaluation. The first to object publicly to the report of suicide was Seattle Public Access host Richard Lee. A week following Cobain's death, Lee aired the first episode of an ongoing series called Kurt Cobain Was Murdered, saying there were several discrepancies in the police reports including several changes in the nature of the shotgun blast. Lee acquired a video that was taped on April 8, 1994 from the tree outside Cobain's garage. It showed the scene around Cobain's body. Lee claimed it showed a marked absence of blood for what was reported as a point-blank shotgun blast to the head. Several pathology experts have stated that a shotgun blast inside the mouth often results in less blood unlike a shotgun blast to the head. Tom Grant was a private investigator hired by Courtney Love to find Cobain after his departure from drug rehabilitation. He said he believes that Cobain was murdered. Grant's theory has been analyzed and questioned by several books, television shows, and films including the 2015 docudrama Soaked in Bleach. Grant was still under Courtney Love's employment when Cobain's body was found. Grant has stated that he finds the events surrounding Cobain's death to be filled with lies, contradictions in logic, and countless inconsistencies. Motivated by profit over truth as well as business deals and personal career considerations, Courtney Love and her lawyers have engaged in an effort to keep the public from learning the real facts of this case. There are several components to Grant's theory. One component is Grant's assertion that Cobain could not have injected himself with such a large dose of heroin and still have been able to pull the trigger. Grant says he based this belief on his lack of knowing about any studies or evidence to indicate that such a high dose could be survived. He does not rule out whether a counterexample might exist. Another component is Grant's belief that Cobain's note was doctored to make it only appear to be a suicide note. A third component is the purported lack of fingerprints from Cobain or others at the scene. He also asserts that Courtney Love had financial motivation to kill Cobain in the form of rumors that Cobain was planning to divorce her. Including the fact that Cobain had turned down an offer to headline the 1994 Lollapalooza Festival for nearly $10 million. 
In studying the Rome incident journalists contacted the doctor who treated Cobain after the incident. The doctor contested the claim that the Rome overdose was a suicide attempt and said we can usually tell a suicide attempt. This didn't look like one to me. He also contradicted Courtney Love's claim that 50 row hypnol pills were removed from Cobain's stomach. The journalist said the doctor believes Courtney may have mixed a large number of pills into Kurt's champagne. Stating that when Cobain took a drink he was actually unknowingly ingesting large amounts of the drug that were enough to kill him. But if that's the case, why did she call the police when she found him unconscious on the floor? If she wanted Kurt dead why didn't she just leave him on the floor until he died? The doctor believes the claim that the Rome incident was a suicide attempt was not made until after Cobain's death. Prior to the shooting some close to Cobain firmly denied he had wanted to die. The doctor also believes that if that were true Cobain's friends and family would have been told in order that they could keep a close watch on him. Others assert that these denials were simply self-serving in an effort to mask what was really going on behind the scenes. Lee Ronaldo guitarist for Sonic Youth told Rolling Stone Rome was only the latest installment of those around Cobain keeping a semblance of normalcy for the outside world. A homicide detective involved in the case dismissed the doctor's theory saying the doctor hasn't shown us a shred of proof that this was anything other than suicide. Another homicide detective was quoted as saying an experienced detective would never have come up with the theories that he's come up with. Filmmaker Nick Broomfield brought a film crew to visit a number of people associated with both Cobain and Love. Love's estranged father, Cobain's aunt, and one of the couple's former nannies. Broomfield also spoke to the mentor's band leader Eldon L. Duce Hoke who claimed that Courtney Love had offered him $50,000 to kill Cobain. Although Eldon L. Duce Hoke claimed that he knew who killed Cobain he did not mention who. He mentioned speaking to someone called Alan or Alan before quickly interjecting I mean my friend and I'll let the FBI catch him. According to Mentor's bass player Steve Broy the whole story was concocted to sell supermarket tabloids. Broomfield incidentally captured Eldon L. Duce Hoke's final interview as he died days later when he was struck by a train. Broomfield titled the Finnish documentary Kurt and Courtney, released on February 27, 1998. Broomfield felt he had not uncovered enough evidence to conclude the existence of a conspiracy. In a 1998 interview he summed up his thoughts by saying I think that he committed suicide. I don't think that there's a smoking gun and I think there's only one way you can explain a lot of things around his death. Not that he was murdered but that there was just a lack of caring for him. I just think that Courtney Love had moved on and he Cobain was expendable. The journalists followed a similar path and attempted to investigate the murder theory themselves. Based on evidence gathered in interviews they believe that Cobain wanted to divorce Love near the time of his death. She was looking for a vicious divorce lawyer to help crush a prenuptial agreement she had reportedly signed that would keep their respective fortunes separate in the event of divorce. They also made the case that because the coroner in Cobain's case was an admitted friend of Love's that this was a conflict of interest. Their initial book, Who Killed Kurt Cobain was released in 1999 and drew a similar conclusion to Broomfield's film. There wasn't enough evidence to conclusively prove foul play and there was more than enough to demand that the case be reopened. The overall consensus amongst Cobain's close friends and family is that he committed suicide but some of Cobain's friends and family members also believe Cobain was murdered. Courtney Love's father has shared his belief that Love had a motive. There is evidence of foul play and the case should be reopened. Cobain's grandfather also publicly stated that he believed Cobain was murdered. In August 2005 Sonic Youth's Kim Gordon was asked about Cobain's death in an interview for Uncut magazine. When asked what she thought to be Cobain's motive for suicide she replied, I don't even know that he killed himself. There are people close to him who don't think that he did. When asked if she thought someone else had killed him she answered I do yes. Her then-husband stated Kurt died in a very harsh way. It wasn't just an OD and he actually killed himself violently. It was so aggressive and he wasn't an aggressive person. He was a smart person and he had an interesting intellect. So it kind of made sense because it doesn't really jive with what we know. Gordon said that she had not been surprised to hear of Cobain's suicide stating I'll always remember the day I was called to tell me Kurt had shot himself. Of course I was totally shocked but I wasn't entirely surprised. There had been an incident in Rome where Kurt had OD'd, but the details were never clear. Others have dismissed or ignored the conspiracy theories surrounding Cobain's death. In an interview with The Independent, 
former Nirvana manager and friend of Cobain, Danny Goldberg emphasized Cobain's erratic and depressed behavior in the days and weeks leading up to his death stating it's ridiculous. He killed himself because I saw him the week beforehand and he was depressed. He tried to kill himself six weeks earlier and he talked and written about suicide a lot. He was on drugs and he got a gun. Why do people speculate about it? The tragedy of the loss is so great people look for other explanations. I don't think there's any truth at all to it. Nirvana's bassist stated I can't believe people think that I would confess to them being part of a criminal conspiracy. I beg anyone who thinks they have any real evidence of foul play to go to the police. One of the reasons I am convinced Kurt killed himself is that he purchased a 20-gauge shotgun. Kurt was not interested in hunting birds or squirrels. He bought that firearm as a suicide device. Suicide is not rational. In the April 19, 2004 issue of People magazine some of his family shared a statement about his death. Our family has dreaded the 10th anniversary of the death of our son, stepson and brother Kurt Cobain. Not only do we mourn his passing but we can never forget him. We're constantly reminded by the controversy surrounding his death and the innuendos that he was murdered. With the death of a loved one by suicide a family experiences the guilt and what-ifs. With the death of an icon it never goes away and we all know that Kurt killed himself. Courtney did not kill him nor did she have him killed. We hope that all the quacks who try to make money by questioning his death will remember the music and remember that he did have a family that loved him. He had a beautiful little girl who doesn't deserve to forever be reminded of the garbage surrounding his death. On April 10, 1994 a public memorial service was held at Seattle Center where a recording of Courtney Love reading Cobain's suicide note was played. Near the end of the vigil Courtney Love arrived and distributed some of his clothing to fans who remained. In the following days Love consoled and mourned with fans who came to her house. Thank you for watching and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe similar content. Rock on!